Hello, Photopillars. I am Rafael Pons. Welcome to another masterclass, the first masterclass of the year. And today we're going to learn how to post process, how to edit your landscape photos in Photoshop with Mr. Sean Backshow. Sean, how are you? Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Rafa. I'm great and I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited, and uh, I believe uh, all the people watching us now live are super excited to learn from a really true master, Photoshop master, and I can't wait to learn from you guys. Oh, well, uh, with all the awesome people that uh, PhotoPills has had on these master classes, it's a it's going it's a tough <laughs> act to uh, tough acts to follow, but I'll do I'll do my best. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You'll do, you'll do a great job for sure. <laughs> what are we gonna learn today, Sean? Well, um, yeah, today we're going to focus mostly on uh, Photoshop and my Photoshop workflow. And uh, I'm going to be talking about, you know, some kind of backstory on what's my motivation in my images? What am I trying to do with my imagery? And then what's my workflow and how do I work? And um, Photoshop is my tool of choice. There's lots of tools for editing photos available these days. And I'm not advocating one over any other one, but it just so happens that Photoshop is, is my tool of choice. And so that's what we're going to focus on is what do I do in Photoshop when I'm working on images? Are you going to use uh, some basic uh, techniques and other more advanced ones? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'll start off with some kind of some basic Photoshop uh, kind of things that I do all the time and just because they're basic doesn't mean they're not useful. So definitely shows some kind of basic ideas, some really useful things that pretty much anyone um, at whatever level in Photoshop can put to use. And then, uh, you know, it wouldn't be possible to show how I edit photos without also showing some, some more advanced tools and applications and methods. So we'll get as far into those as, as we have time for and see how it goes. But um, obviously a lot of, my educational work is tied in with uh, luminosity, the use of luminosity masses tools and the TK panel. So um, I couldn't show how I edit my photos without incorporating some of that as well. Awesome, awesome. I can wait, I can wait. <laughs> uh, but for the people that don't know you, uh, who is Sean Bagshaw? Uh, Sean Bagshaw is uh, um, a, a photographer, photographer. <laughs> a, a human being. <laughs> A human being, he's a, he's a photography, uh, I, I, I call myself a photography geek or a photography nerd. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I live in Southern Oregon in, in the United States and it's a beautiful area where I live. It's a lot of open countryside. Uh, I grew up here and uh, that has inspired a lot of, of my photography. Um, and I was a middle school science and math teacher for the first part of my career as an adult. Uh, well, if you can call me an adult, I don't I think that's a stretch. <laughs> uh, but I moved away from teaching or being a school teacher uh, and went, became a full-time photographer um, in 2004. So I've been doing this wow. now, like I guess 17 years or so, somewhere in there full-time. And after, you know, getting my photography business off the ground for the first several years, uh, the teaching aspect uh, of my of the things that I do in life kind of came back in. So once I felt I had something to share and had some information and knowledge in photography that I could share with others, uh, I've been able to kind of wrap my teaching and photography together. So a lot of what I do these days is photography education. Awesome, and you're teaching uh, workshops, you're teaching, uh, doing presentations for camera clubs, you're teaching live now, and also you're teaching uh, uh, on your YouTube channel because uh, you have a great, great YouTube channel. And guys, if you wanna learn Master Photoshop and all the panels and <laughs> everything, make sure that you're subscribed to uh, Sean's YouTube channel because he has amazing tutorial there. Ah, well, thank you. Yeah. And uh, in fact, we've collaborated on a couple, which has been oh, yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. So yeah, the YouTube channel is great. That's a great way I can kind of kind of put some educational material and content out there that's just kind of open and available. And then, yeah, all the other things you said, the, you know, presentations, conferences, workshops, camera club stuff, 
Uh, and then um, I'm going to share my screen right now. Uh, my website I have available. Um, so this is, yeah, this is my website. And if you go to the tab over here, it's probably small, but it's called, it says uh, tutorials and TK panels, mm -hmm. to that page. And I have a whole bunch of Photoshop, mostly Photoshop courses. Uh -huh. um, but there's also, I have a Lightroom course and also a course about the TK panel. And I also offer Tony Kuiper's TK panel through my website as well. So all that stuff, all that part of my teaching is available there on my website. And um, tell me, for, I just want to say, for if you don't know, today is Rafa's birthday. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to Rafa. I don't know why he's here talking to me on his birthday, but you know, to each their own. But for Rafa's birthday, um, everyone gets a, a gift. So you can use the code uh, PHOTOPILLS, just one word, PHOTOPILLS, on, on my website uh, for 20% off anything on this page. So, awesome. And that's good for two weeks. PHOTOPILL, good for two weeks. Thank you. Thank you for, for the gift. And yes, yes, today is my, my birthday. <laughs> 42, I'm turning 42. Oh. trips around the sun already so i'm getting, uh, getting old, man. Man. i wish i was 42 i remember 42 that was a, that was a good time it's been a long time a long time ago i i have to say i think uh, we are at uh, a decade apart <laughs> you look younger than me uh, by the way and uh, let's go to your photography show us some photos to inspire us and and see the results we can get sure applying your uh, techniques yeah, let's take a look here. Um, yeah, so let me share a little bit about, oops, actually, I didn't want to do that. I want to go full screen. There we go. So I just want to share a little bit about, uh, yeah, my photography. What do my photos look like for anyone who's not familiar? Um, what's my motivation in photography? How would I get into it? That kind of stuff. Just briefly here at the beginning. Um, so my, my real motivation in photography what keeps me going as a photographer is my love of the outdoors and adventure and exploration. Um, and that goes way back before I was a photographer. In fact, uh, I, I grew up in the hills of, of Southern Oregon. Uh, this is my current town. This is Ashland, Oregon. I grew up a couple hours north of here, but similar landscape and uh, just beautiful kind of mountainous, Pacific Northwest area. Yeah, and growing up, I, I just ran through the hills and explored. And as I grew up and got into college, um, I continued that and started doing things like rock climbing and backpacking and mountaineering and all sorts of different things. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so that's, that's me looking like a total dork. Um, many a long time ago and these are back as these first few images are actually from old slide films so they're very low quality i was a horrible <laughs> film photographer um but yeah so before i even really took photographs having adventures in the landscape was exciting to me and i loved doing that and um it was those experiences that got me thinking about photography in the first place because when i was out climbing and going to various places that I really enjoyed and had wonderful uh, adventures in, I wanted to document that and share that with other people. Um, I didn't, I guess I didn't care if anyone else wanted to hear it or not. I just wanted to share. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I picked up a, just a, a, a simple camera, a little point and shoot film camera to take with me just so I could document. And it was purely documentary. That was my only goal. Um, but throughout my life out in doing these adventures, uh, there just have been certain moments that really spoke to me deeply beyond the, the activity, more on a personal level. And, um, you know, sometimes they're so life affirming and special that, you know, I wanted to capture them and I wanted to share them, but I wanted to share more than just a document of what we were doing. I wanted to share something uh, more personal about my experience and what I was feeling because, you know, what we what we see with our eyes or what a camera captures 
that's just the visual information. But an experience is so much more than just the visual part. I mean, that's a that's a part, but you've got a lot of other senses involved. So, you know, you know, are, are you tired? Are you hungry? Are you cold? Are you hot? Um, what's the emotional state, you know, in any particular situation? Um, what's been the story leading up to that event? What, uh, you know, what else is going on? Who else are you with? There's so much about an experience. And I more and more wanted to communicate more than just what I saw. But my photography skills in some of these events just, and the equipment I had, just really struggled. <laughs> you know, I, I struggled to really communicate some of these scenes. Here's a great example of one of my early attempts at photographing Smith Rock State Park in Oregon, which I think a lot of people who are watching have either been there or seen photos of it. And you can see from my my skills and, and knowledge and equipment at the time that this just does not communicate what that scene is, is like. So that really kind of got me into trying to learn more about photography, how to take better photos. And also, because <laughs> I was a horrible film photographer, once digital um, came on the scene in the early 2000s, uh, I adopted it right away because immediately it made more sense to me and having the ability to edit my own photos, to uh, develop my photos. You know, I wasn't a darkroom developer. I shot slide film in the film days. So you just have to, you know, shoot and pray, you know, <laughs> kind of think yeah. that the, the photo pills uh, motto is the, the plan and pray. Yeah. But it was also a lot of just shoot and pray because you'd take a photo and then until you got your slide film processed and returned, you had no idea if you had accomplished a good image or not. And most of mine were not. <laughs> so once I had control and the ability to capture the raw materials and develop my own images, that really changed photography for me and that ability to um, uh, communicate, try or at least attempt to communicate the bigger experience to people who were viewing the images who hadn't been there or even people who had been there but had a whole different experience than what I had because we're all individuals and, you know, whatever's going on in, in my head is not necessarily what's going on in anyone else's head. So that got me into photography and I began going on trips with the basically the main purpose to take photos. So this is a trip I did many years ago to the enchantments uh, in the nor uh, in the, uh, the Washington Cascade range. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is with my friends, David Cobb and Adam Gibbs. And we were up there, you know, there was a time when I would have been going to climb those peaks we see in the background. But on this trip, I was there just to photograph them. So we went all the way in and, you know, got ourselves there it's a long backpack into that uh, mountain range and then stayed there for a week just to photograph. So nice, nice. Uh, fun guys, by the way, I, I was lucky to meet them in my last crusade in the U S a few years ago. Nice they, are, they are fun guys. Yeah. Great guys and great adventurers too. Um, <laughs> Crazy. <okay>. then. <laughs> yeah. A lot of fun. So anyway, so that's, um, kind of the evolution from, you know, picking up a camera just to document, what I was doing to actually becoming interested in the creative aspect and how can I creatively express my experiences with others through the photographic medium. Um, the, the challenge there is, and I, I guess, so that's my main motivation is mm -hmm. that I think lots of people have different, you know, everyone has maybe different motivations for taking photographs. Some people, it may be about concepts that are in their head that they want to create. Other people, it might be about, you know, the experience isn't so much important. It's the final product. I just want to create a good photo, whatever I have to do to, to get the, a good photo, I'm willing to put up with. Or other people, you know, might be creating images. Their motivation is commercial. You know, they're creating images for companies or other people who have hired them to create certain images. Other people may want to get a lot of, um, you know, people just to see their photos online or wherever, or they want to sell art or whatever it is. My motivation has always been the experience itself. And the photo is completely a bonus. So I'm out 
doing these experiences anyways. That's my first goal is where can I go and have an adventure and explore and see new things and have these moments that really impact me. And I do that all the time without a camera. And so I'm out doing that and not taking photos of it. If I have a camera and I can capture it and then try to share that experience through a photograph, then like I said, that's kind of the bonus part for me. So all my photographs, why am I taking them? It's because I'm having an experience and see if I can communicate something about that. And, you know, I think a lot of times I probably don't successfully communicate <laughs> to other people what it was like, but that's part of the fun too, is I feel like I'm not, um, you know, I'm never going to reach the, the, the finish line with photography. I can always work at it and learn more and be more effective at communicating through my photographs. I always have more to, to I always have room to improve. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, that's the beauty of photography. Every day you can learn new things, live new experiences, meet different people. And yeah, you know, we're here for a couple of, of years and it's all about enjoying. And photography is a great way to enjoy the great outdoors and communicate. So I love your photos, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, the, the per that's another great aspect of photography you brought up. You know, the, the, you know it's something you can do solo you know, mm -hmm. on your own, which I do a lot. And I enjoy that time just with myself, but it's also great that it's a social activity as well. And you can meet people. And a lot of times in landscape photography, it's, it's a, it's a community of people who have similar interests, you know, we like the same things. Um, and uh, yeah, and getting together, you know, like we've been together at photography conferences and hopefully Photo Pills Camp one of these days soon. We, we oh, had yeah. to miss it in 2020, and it looks like again in 2021. But 2022 for Photo Pills Camp. 2022 is going to happen for sure. I think uh, we have the dates already. So yep, they're, they're yeah, from, from May 20 May 29th to June the 6th or something like this in 2022. So uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun in our little island, Menorca. I can't wait to have you there. I, I'm really excited to get there for sure. So all of that makes photography excellent for sure. Uh, so anyway, um, just I'm going to go through fairly quickly here, just some kind of examples of some of my images. And I've got a few before and after examples in there just so you can kind of see, because this, this uh, what we're doing today is about developing images using Photoshop. So most of the images that people see of mine have been developed. Mm -hmm. It's not how they came out of the camera. So it's always interesting, I think, to see what are the raw materials from the camera look like before they've been developed. So I've got a few of those in there. So, you know, my love of climbing and mountaineering and just world travel in general, um, you know, I have a love affair with, with the mountain ranges of the world. So a lot of my images obviously pay homage to, to my love of mountains. So these first few images you can kind of see is a Patag Patagonia Obviously, Mount Fitzroy, a lot of people know this, this mountain range, very familiar. Um, this is in the, uh, the Dolomites in the Italian Alps. Uh, on a trip with my colleague, Erin Bobnick, she took me to this really special place. Uh, oh, and there's the before. So that's what my camera was able to record. And like I said, that's the raw materials. Mm -hmm. That what the camera sees and collects is not my experience. You know, the camera is not an artist. The camera is not having an experience. The camera is just a tool for recording light. And if you're photographing, you know, raw files, those files have the most information and the most latitude for developing, but they're also very flat and blah in the start. They don't represent very often what the scene looked like, first of all, and second of all, felt like at, at all, because the camera has no way to know what I was feeling. So that's my expression of that image, how it felt to me, and how that experience is in my imagination. And, you know, that's what came from the camera. So that's the starting point. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the mountains, the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. Uh, more in the Alps in, in Europe. This is in the Cascade Range here in my home state. This is Mount Jefferson. 
Um, this is one of the images that we'll work on a little bit later. And uh, yeah, so we have volcanic peaks out here. So, you know, these big volcanoes that stick up. It's very different than, than the Alps. I don't want a beautiful area. Definitely, yeah. That's that's one of the that's kind of one of the uh, the real gems of Oregon, I think. Oh, and sadly, so this is Mount Jefferson, and this area here, I'm up on a ridge, kind of looking out over. It's called Jefferson Park. It's mm -hmm. a wilderness area. You can only uh, backpack in there. There's no roads, no facilities, nothing. You know, even in like I know in a lot of the European Alps, you'll get high up into the mountains, and there'll still be mountain huts, or there'll be um, you know, cable cars, or, or there'll be something up there uh, yeah. in, in the wilderness areas in the United States, because we're such a more recent country, areas have been set aside as wilderness. There's no development at all. And oh. so you have to walk in, bring all of everything with you. And uh, unfortunately, with all the bad uh, wildfires that we had in Oregon and on the West Coast this last summer, this is one of the areas that burned. No way. And so I haven't been able to go back there since the fire. I don't know, you know, what condition it's in. Um, I hope it's not damaged too badly, but a fire did pass through this exact area. Yeah, this one thing I don't understand about the U.S., my experience there is that there were fires everywhere. And, uh, you know, for me, here in Europe, when we have a fire, <laughs> we're like, oh, crazy. Let's, let's uh, you know, let's stop it. But there it was like, okay, everything is burning and uh, I... I don't know. I don't know. It was, like, it was it was like a crazy experience to me. It is. It is crazy. Um, part of that is. I mean, so I think yeah. A lot of Europe is very developed. There's not wilderness. Um, you yeah. know, so yeah. people live everywhere, or yeah. it's all used um, landscape. So mm -hmm. yeah, you don't want it to burn. The wild yeah. landscape, especially you know, out here in the West, naturally burned historically. Okay. Um, and that's was the fire control was fires could happen. And mm -hmm. so no fires ever got really, well, I don't want to say no, but it was much less frequent to have a really huge out of control uh, wildfires. Mm -hmm. But through fire suppression um, and climate change and a variety of other mm -hmm. kind of human policies, we still have the wilderness areas, but there's so much fuel. And now with climate change, that uh, gets very dry and very hot. Okay. And, yeah, so when the fires start, they're much bigger and more damaging, I think, than probably they were historically. Yeah, it's also super, super difficult to stop. Yeah, yep. But, yeah. And in areas like, you know, in the mountains, you actually want them to burn because if you don't let them burn, then the next time they burn, they'll burn even worse. So okay. it's a challenging, it's a challenging situation for sure. Anyway, some more mountain uh, landscapes. This is in uh, Switzerland. We may work on this image a little later too, obviously the Matterhorn in Switzerland. And, uh, but in addition to mountains, uh, you know, kind of I started with mountains in my photography, but um, I really enjoy just photographing scenes uh, in the landscape wherever I can find them. And I know that, uh, you know, the PhotoPills app, which I've been using probably almost since, of, I think you maybe first contacted me when it was fairly new, a new, a new application. Yeah, I think uh, when we launched it in, in 2013, uh, you were one of the first photographers that replied me. I wanted to <laughs> reply. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, that's awesome. And I, it's funny, I don't even, I, know, I remember the communication. I don't even know if I knew that it was a new app at that time, but I just remember thinking, wow, this is really good and useful. And yeah. Uh, and a lot of times I, I, I use the app to do planning. Um, but a lot of my images are nothing I could plan for. And because I enjoy the exploration, the experience so much and just kind of reacting to what I'm seeing, a lot of my photos, you know, like this one, couldn't have planned for. This was, I was on a drive across Oregon to somewhere else. And I just happened to come around a corner, a bend in the road at the perfect time with the perfect light that I've driven by this spot dozens of times before that and never thought it was worth taking a photo of, but this particular morning at this particular time, and I wouldn't have known it unless I had seen it anyway. So how, how did you, how did you see this photo? Because I'm sure that I'm passing by that area and I, I don't take this picture. So you, 
what did you so what did you see uh, that morning that made you wow you saw the photo like this boom straightforward yeah obviously the color and yeah. uh, you know the shapes and the forms and the, the red and the white and, and but the that's part of it but those elements wouldn't be there without the light and mm. um Galen Rao, who's one of my biggest inspirations back when I was getting started in photography. Uh, unfortunately, Galen's not with us anymore, but he had a, has a quote that I say often, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I don't have it up in front of me. But basically, he said that he's never going out to take a photograph of a place, and he doesn't think of taking a shot just to take a photo, to have a photo of a thing or a place. His first thought was always about light and mm -hmm. that's what determined what he would photograph and that's something that's really true for me too it's it's the light so i see light and that's my cue that there's good light or interesting light that is appealing to me now mm -hmm. i need to find something to photograph in that light if i can and i also often say in my presentations i'm i'm often the person who's at the rim of the grand canyon you know this biggest one of the biggest big landscape features on the planet. But if the light in the Grand Canyon isn't interesting to me photographically, but there's a, a, a small tree over here that has great light, I'll be the guy at the Grand Canyon photographing the little tree while everyone else is photographing the Grand Canyon. So for me, the light, I guess, that's the, that's the, the, the main ingredient. And that's this particular situation. That's what, what it was that stopped me. Awesome. Um, so other things besides mountains, you know, forest scenes, the coast, the Oregon coast is amazing. Um, oh, again, here's a little before and after. So this photograph couldn't, my camera couldn't get all this in a single frame. So, you know, I did some exposure bracketing, one for the foreground, one for the sky exposure, and then bringing those together to come to that final image. Uh, wildflower bloom in Northern California with fog and a fog bow, the redwoods, the redwoods are only about an hour and a half or two hours from, from where I live. I love the redwood forest on Northern California coast. It's just magical. Um, Colorado fall color, the Aspen trees. Yeah. The, the desert Southwest here in, in, um, in North America, amazing geological formations and wonderful light you get out in the desert. Um, yeah, so my interests, White Sands National Park, my interests have you know, started with mountains, but have now really expanded out into lots of different things. Oh, and there's another before <laughs> and after to kind of see some images, you know, are closer out of the camera to where I wanna take them and others are farther away and require more work. Um, and then even beyond landscapes, uh, eventually I began noticing more kind of small details and just, um, things that are less about a place and more about maybe tone or line or texture or form and those kinds of things, which is really fun to focus on as well. And you can find interesting lines and shapes. And, uh, and patterns and, uh, you know, minimalism, going very simple. Uh, these kinds of things are all throughout the landscape. So it's really fun to be out exploring and, and looking for things. Oh, here's another before and after. And here's another uh, or an example of, you know, an image where my camera really did see it pretty close to how I wanted to communicate it. I removed a couple of little stray rocks that were distracting and kind of worked with the contrast a little bit. But, you know, the final version of that image is very close to the raw file that my camera captured. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you know, texture, lines, shapes, patterns, all of that stuff, just fascinating for me. And mood, you know, so this is definitely a place, but for me, this image is much more to me personally about the mood that it, I think invokes rather than necessarily being about a particular place. These images are, are great, are awesome. 
I see a lot of comments in the in the chat that are like, "Come on, let's go for the Photoshop thing." I, okay, I, I let's uh, let's do it. Know, making magic on Photoshop. What let's do you think? Do it. Is it the yep. right time? I think let's do it. Absolutely. So yeah. let me uh, get out of here. Uh, see, I'm going to stop sharing this because I need to share a smaller screen now. Yeah, it seems that the image now is a bit pixelated. Uh, let's see how how it turns. Yeah, let's see here. I need to get back to. Uh, let's see. Oh, by the way, we have almost nine nine hundred people watching live. Nine hundred. Yeah. Holy moly! I think that's got to be one of the biggest audiences um, <laughs> I've ever. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, hello everybody. Thanks for being here. That's yeah. a lot of people. That's great. All right, so let's let's get into this. Let's get into the actual reason why we're here. So I got to get to sharing the right window, which is currently I can't on my little screen here. I think it's this one. Let's try that. Okay, uh, do we see Lightroom? Now we see Lightroom, yes. Okay, so this is, I'm going to be talking and showing Photoshop. That's the kind of the point of this course. But I wanted to start with a little bit in Lightroom because uh, Lightroom I use in conjunction with Photoshop. I do a lot of the foundation setting for my images in Lightroom before I move over to Photoshop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many different applications out there that we have available to us to edit images with these days. Um, and depending on what it is that you want to accomplish, you know, you got to find the tool that's going to work best for you. Lightroom can do a lot of the things that most photographers want to do with their images. I know um, in the masterclass with Albert Dross, mm -hmm. for anyone out there who hasn't seen that one on the Photo Pills channel, go check it out. He really shows how much you can do just with Lightroom. Um, uh, really some great examples. Um, and sometimes I do edit a lot in Lightroom. And mm -hmm. for certain images, I don't f have the need to use Photoshop at all. So I'd never even make it to Photoshop. But for most images, I do end up in Photoshop because a lot of the things that you, you can do them in Lightroom but you have more control, more um, finesse, uh, and more options in Photoshop. So if there's something that's simple and easy to do in Lightroom, I'll do it in Lightroom. If I think I can accomplish it better in Photoshop, I'll save that for working in Photoshop. And um, then there are certain things in, that in Photoshop that you just can't do in Lightroom and a lot of other image editing apps. And that's one of the great powerful things about Photoshop is there are certain things that you just, if you want to use those tools and methods, Photoshop's kind of your main option. All right, so this, I wanna start with this image and the re reason I'm starting with this one, cause we're gonna start kind of basic and then work our way up. Uh, awesome. This image, this is the raw file. I haven't done anything. If you look at my uh, my Lightroom adjustments here, I haven't done anything to that uh, at this point. So that's out of the camera. Mm -hmm. And so this is just an example of sometimes things come out of the camera pretty close to maybe how it felt or how, how I want to communicate it. So what would I necessarily do in Lightroom at this point? Um, probably nothing, because I think it's you know, the only thing I might do is I'm looking at my histogram and I can see that I'm up against the, the black point, the black side of my histogram a little bit. And uh, moving over to Photoshop, I, I do wanna just make sure that I'm not clipping any blacks. And you know, a TIFF file, 16-bit TIFF file in Photoshop is gonna have a lot of ability to recover those blacks. But I'm just gonna bring up the black slider just a little bit just to try to pull some of that information away from the, so that the deep shadows aren't fully blocked up. The other thing I can see is my camera was slightly tilted. My horizon and some of these um, hoodoos and things are, are kind of rotated to the left or counterclockwise. So 
cropping and leveling in Lightroom is you can do it in Photoshop, but it's very easy to do in Lightroom. And it's also non-destructive in Lightroom. You can always undo it. So I'm going to go into the crop tool and just really quickly um, rotate a little bit so it feels like things are a bit more level. Um, the other thing, actually, you know, I'm not going to do, let me reset that. I don't, <laughs> the reason why I'm going to reset that is because using the crop tool, it immediately crops inside the image and that crops off some of my sky and foreground that I actually don't want to lose. So instead of the crop tool, I'm going to come down here to the transform tab in Lightroom. And instead of cropping, I'm going to rotate. And that enables me to do the same thing, except for it won't crop inside the image. It's going to leave some little edges here hanging out that are blank, but it's not going to, I'm not going to lose any of my sky or my foreground. And actually that's what I want to do there. So now with that, I think I am ready to open in Photoshop. So really I didn't do much to this particular image in the raw file. Uh, so I'll just go to edit in, edit in Photoshop. And now I need to switch over to Photoshop, which is right here. Okay. We see Photoshop? Yeah, we see Photoshop. Excellent. Okay. So like I said, this image really is fairly close to what I felt about that scene. There's this low late light that was just raking in from the right, low across those uh, those rock formations. Uh, the sky was kind of moody overcast. And, you know, there was lots of shadow and highlight variation and um, texture and form and, and all of that. And it really comes out pretty well. I think what I want to do with this is to enhance the mood. And something that I do in a lot of my images is um, because skies are just inherently brighter than the landscape, but we don't see them that way. Our, our brain and our visual uh, perception tends to balance lighting. You know, we have our internal photo developing that goes on in what we see. And so in a lot of cases, I like for mood and also just for tonal balance to make adjustments to my sky that are separate from my landscape and I'll darken my sky. So that's one of the things I want to do is bring the brightness of the sky down a little bit. That'll actually help the landscape look even brighter, but I'll probably also want to brighten the landscape a little bit as well. Also, because of the way I rotated the image in Lightroom, I've got those, um, those blank little edges there that I need to do something with to fix. And um, yeah, so a little bit of sky work, a little bit of landscape work, fill in the edges, and I'll probably be done with this image. So my workflow in Photoshop, a lot of it is um, not prescribed, not preset. So I don't know ahead of time what I'm going to do. I'm not following a recipe. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain things because of the way Photoshop works that you have to do in a certain order. Lightroom mm -hmm. or Camera Raw, depending on what you're using, and a lot of other uh, software are all non-destructive editing, no matter what you do. So it doesn't matter what order you do it in. You can do anything before or after anything else and it all works together and you never work yourself into a corner. You can always undo things. Mm -hmm. Photoshop doesn't work like that always. So it is possible to do something in Photoshop. If you do it out of order, you can work yourself into back yourself into a corner that you can't undo. So I'm always trying to avoid that. Um, so one of the things that I always try to do first is any pixel altering adjustments. So in this image, um, obviously adding pixels into these blank areas is a pixel altering adjustment. I want to do that up first. If there's any um, transforming or warping that I need to do, if I need to do any cleanup, removing dust spots, anything like that that is affecting the pixels, I need to do that before I do any other adjustments so that they don't um, come back to haunt me later. So let's fill these edges first. This is a this is um, in the current situation of Photoshop. It's really cool tools. This would have been a big pain in the butt years ago, but this is really easy to do now. Here's all you have to do: you hold down Control or Command if you're on a Mac, and you just click on the layer. 
And what that does is it selects the image, the pixels, but it doesn't select the areas that don't have pixels. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually want to fill the areas that don't have pixels. So I want the inverse of that selection. So you can invert a selection. I think it's, I hardly ever use keyboard stuff that much anymore. I think it's control shift I, let's see if I'm right. Yeah, control or command shift I on the keyboard inverts a selection. So now instead of the pixels selected, the areas without pixels are selected. Mm -hmm. um, the other way to do that, and for anybody watching who's not familiar, this is the TK panel. This guy right here, and here's there's two modules to it. This is one module. Let me slide this up here. This is one module. Actually, there's more than two modules. There's two main modules. This module is for making luminosity mass, and we'll come back to that later. This module is called the Combo or CX module. And basically, this gives me really quick, easy, one-click access to all kinds of stuff that are in Photoshop that you're going to use anyways as a photographer. But normally, you know, you're looking for them in menus and sub-menus and where is it and you're hunting for it or it's in a panel menu somewhere or it's a keyboard shortcut that you have to have memorized or go look up what's the keyboard shortcut. This puts all of those things here in color-coded buttons. So when you want to do something, and so I know if I want to invert a selection, I just have the red inverse button right here. You just click it that inverts my selection. So you're going to see me using this a lot. Anytime I'm using this panel, I'm probably doing just something that you can do lots of other ways in Photoshop. But for me, it's easiest and fastest to do it with this module. Um, so that's what this is about. And I think probably a lot of people watching are familiar with this. And there are other um, panels out there, extension panels that you can get for Photoshop as well. I use the TK panel. I've been using it since 2006. All right, uh, so I've now inverted that selection. So I have my pixels selected. I wanna expand that selection a little bit because right now it's right along the edge of the pixels and that can leave a little gap uh, of my fill and I don't want a gap. So I need to come up here to select and modify the selection. I wanna expand the selection. So I'm gonna expand the selection, just five pixels is all. And all that'll do is it'll overlap the selection into the actual pixel area a little bit. So little five pixel expansion. And then the next thing I wanna do is use Photoshop's content aware fill feature to intelligently fill in those blank spaces with new pixels and let Photoshop decide what are gonna be the best pixels to go in there. And again, if you're going to get to that, I think it's like edit uh, content aware fill if you have to go find it in the menu. But right here, there's a CAF button, content aware fill button. Uh, that's easy right there. Boom. I just click it. goes right into the content aware fill workspace. I have content aware fill all set up to auto select and auto fill. And I'm gonna let it do that here. Uh, see, it's still thinking. <laughs> it's a big um, bunch of calculations. But here in the preview, the green is all the areas that Photoshop's sampling from. And then it's choosing what pixels to fill in. In this little preview, it looks okay. Um, you could zoom in and double check, but I'm just gonna go ahead and click okay for time and let that come back here and fill in. And now I can deselect the selection I had, and I've filled in those edges. So that's a really quick, easy way if you've got blank edges or blank areas in an image that you need to fill in. And depending on the content, it doesn't get it perfect all the time, but in this situation where the sky and this, the foreground details are fairly uh, easy and it had plenty of places to sample from, uh, it's really, I would say, pretty much seamless the way it filmed it. Uh, filled it in. And now I was able to rotate the image and also not crop off anything. I didn't lose any of my composition. So that's something you can do in Photoshop that you can't do in Lightroom. Super uh, nice. Super, super sorry? Fast. It's super nice and super fast to do it. Yeah, super fast, super easy. And so sometimes people say, so, you know, yeah, I can do all this stuff in Lightroom. Why do I need Photoshop? Well, there's a super fast, easy example. That's something that you can't do in, in Lightroom. And I think probably a lot of other um, editing applications as well. Some you probably can. Uh, all right, so that's 
first step was getting those things filled in. I would also zoom in and spend a lot of time at 100% just looking around the image to make sure that I didn't have something like dust spots or um, distracting things coming in at the edges of my image or anything like that. The other thing too that I often want to do at this stage is deal with um, any lens distortion issues. So you don't really see it too much in this image, but uh, my camera was a wide angle lens and it's pointed down slightly. And what that does is it causes things out here to tip outward. And with these formations, it's not super obvious, but it's still a little obvious. Um, things like trees or buildings, it becomes really obvious. So this would also be the time to do a correction for that. And so to correct for that, I'm going to go to um, free transform, which it's up in the file, uh, no edit menu, transform, free transform, it's right there, or control T, either one. Um, but once you're in transform, you can switch back and forth between transform mode and this little icon here is warp mode. And I actually want to go to warp mode. And when I'm in warp mode, transform mode, you can just move things kind of in straight lines. But in warp mode, you can move things in curved ways. You can do curved transformations. And that's what I want to do here. But I don't want to curve the whole image. I just want to curve this upper part where these outward leaning pieces are problematic. But I don't want to affect my foreground. I like how my foreground is. So I can grab this little tool right here in warp mode. And that enables me to put a line where I want my warp to stop. So somewhere about here, I don't want to warp below that line. I only want to warp above it. So now I can grab this corner and bring this over like so until these guys look more straight up and down. And same on this side, bring it over until these guys look more straight up and down. Uh, maybe this guy looks like he's now tipped too far. So I can bring him back the other way a little bit. And I'm just trying to make things look more vertical like they actually were. And when I'm good, I'll click the checkbox and commit to that. Uh, now I've got more gapped edges. So again, depending on the content of the image, uh, filling may work better or less uh, good. In this case, let's try it. I always try things and see how it works. So the same technique we did before, controller man, command click on the image to select that, invert the selection, uh, go to modify and expand the selection by five pixels, and then go to content aware fill and let Photoshop see if it can figure out how to fill that, those blank areas in. And we'll see, we'll see. We'll see if it does a good job or not. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like over here looks pretty good. This side looks a little problematic. For time, I'm going to go ahead. You know, I could mess around with the controls in here and try to maybe improve it. But for now, I'm just going to say OK. And yeah, definitely it didn't get it great right over here. This side looks, uh, let me deselect. Yeah, this side looks great. This side, not so much. So here's where I could decide I could either crop that off if I didn't like it, or I could go in with something like the clone stamp tool or the healing brush and try to work with that more. In this case, I think I am just going to go back to free transform. And actually, let me zoom down here a little bit. And this problematic area over here, I'm just going to drag that out and get it out of there. And kind of stretching my composition that direction a little bit and this direction a little bit actually, I think, works. So I'll go with that. OK, so now we've taken care of that issue on this side. Everything looks good. Got all my rocks straight up and down. Uh, yeah. So the next thing I said I wanted to do is work on the sky a little bit. And this is something I do in almost every landscape image that has a distinct sky and distinct landscape is I will make a sky selection. And a sky selection will enable me to isolate sky adjustments from land adjustments because a lot of times I want to adjust those two separately. Mm -hmm. And 
some images creating a sky selection is difficult because you've got a tree that's sticking up into the sky or you've got clouds that are partly obscuring some of the the horizon in those cases making a sky selection gets a little tricky um but this image i picked this one to start with because this one's an easy one now uh in the past i've usually just used the quick select tool so that's this guy right here, quick selection. And that is kind of a smart tool that when you drag along, if there's a real obvious boundary, it'll find that and just kind of stick to it. And so that's a quick way to select it, but it's not perfect. It missed some areas over here. So you might have to come in and refine where that edge is a little bit and go back and forth and get it to try to really find all of that edge as accurately as possible. And then what I'll do is I'll go into the select and mask workspace, which is under, I think, yeah, again, select menu, select and mask, or there's the keyboard shortcut, or this is my favorite button in the TK uh, panel. It's the S and M button. Um, anyway, uh, anybody, yeah, yeah, that's a bad joke, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the S and M button, select and mask, you go into the select a mask workspace and then you can refine that selection and really get it perfected so that, cause I want my adjustments to be invisible. I don't want anybody to see them. So if I have a poor selection, then the edge of that adjustment that I make is gonna be visible and it's gonna be obvious. And I'm editing my images for big print. Not right. all my images get printed big, but that's always my final goals. I want, the best way that I know to really communicate through a photograph is in a large print or some other sort of large presentation. Um, so I'm always thinking about that, that level of quality. Mm -hmm. If all you're gonna do is look at images on a phone screen, um, then being that careful probably isn't necessary. Um, you know, on Instagram, I could have a really sloppy selection there and a horrible sloppy adjustment, but small on a phone screen, no one's ever gonna see it. But I know that I want my images to have the potential to be enjoyed large. So nice. anyway, nice. so that's where the select and mask and going in and refining. However, Photoshop kind of upped the game lately. So I'm gonna deselect this because as easy as that was to just drag that and then go into select a mask, Photoshop in, I think, October released an update. And I recently did a video on my YouTube channel about this um, that didn't get a lot of attention. There's a sky replacement feature uh, that got a lot of attention. And if you <laughs> want to replace skies in your images, that's a great tool in Photoshop. I don't replace skies. You know, I don't have anything against it, you know, like ethically or whatever. Um, for me, like I said, my images are about the experience. So I'm trying to, first of all, have the experience, which is the important yeah. part. And second of all, communicate the experience. So for me, if the sky didn't look how I wanted it in the situation, I'm not that interested in making it look different in the image. I'd rather just do the best I can with the sky I have or not take the photo and keep having experiences until I have an experience that I wanna take a photograph of. Um, but other people have a vision in their head. It doesn't matter about the experience. It matters about the image and you know what their vision for that image is. And so I'm fine with that too. That's just not you know where my motivation is coming from. Uh, anyway, so the 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 sky replacement feature is not a big one I use, but kind of a byproduct of that is if you go to select menu right here, there's a new select sky feature, and this is amazing. You click that and I would say 90% of the time, it with one click creates a perfect sky selection. And not only is it just a perfect sky selection, it actually looks for areas that maybe you don't want a perfectly hard edge selection and it, it'll kind of like auto feather down into the landscape a little bit. So I always nowadays try that first because it's so quick and easy. And if it doesn't give me a selection, of the sky that I like, then I'll go back and try other more complicated methods. Uh, and then once I've got the sky selection, one of the things I always do is save it 
in uh, as a channel, as an alpha channel. And that means I can just get it back really quickly and easily later. Um, so I'll do that right now. Um, this is the channels panel in Photoshop. And you can, it's got the, the RGB channels that are always in there, but you can save other alpha channels and you can save cha uh, selections as channels. And I think it's, um, I think it's this button right here in the channels panel that does that for you. Or of course there's a button in the TK panel that does it too. So I just use that. And I just call that my sky selection and say, okay. And now there's that saved sky selection. Um, whoops, uh, I'll deselect. So you can see that sky selection isn't a perfect hard edge selection. Photoshop's actually going in and making some decisions about how that selection's gonna look to best blend adjustments between the sky and the landscape. So that's pretty cool. All right, so I've got that save sky selection and anytime that I wanna use it, I can just control or command click on it and reload it. So that's what I did. And now with that sky selection, I can make an adjustment for the sky that'll have a mask that will direct my adjustment to the sky. So I'm gonna make a curves adjustment. And this is how I can get a curves adjustment from the panel. You can use any other way to get a curves adjustment layer that you like, but that's how I'm gonna do it. So here's my curves adjustment layer. Here's the mask that came with it. There's that sky mask that Photoshop gave me. And so that mask is going to direct my adjustment. So anywhere that's white in the mask is gonna get all of the adjustment. Anywhere that's black in the mask is gonna get none of the adjustment. And then we've got some areas that are shades of gray. Those will get varying amounts of the adjustment. And that's kind of where the feathering or transition of the adjustment is gonna be. I don't know how it's gonna look yet, but we'll, we'll give it a try. So I go to the adjustment and easy way, I, I wanna darken the sky. So an easy way to darken with curves is you just grab in the middle of the curve and pull the curve down and that darkens. You can see it's doing a great job of darkening that sky and not darkening the landscape. And in fact, if I wanna use the curve, let me move this over here just a little bit. If I wanna use the curve to also not only darken, but also kind of increase contrast in the sky, I can do a bit of contrast curve, S curve there, and there we go. So really quickly and easily, I was able to make that sky adjustment separate from the land. If I had tried to make that same adjustment to the sky without the mask, that's what my land would look like. So clearly that adjustment, and this is the thing with adjustments, some adjustments we make globally to the entire image, but so many adjustments really are specific to the part of the image that you're adjusting and you don't want them to be global. And that's one of the things, another one of the things that Photoshop's so good at. You can localize adjustments in Lightroom and other applications and try to get them to the sky, but to create a mask of the sky like this one that gets that adjustment perfectly in the sky is much more difficult to do outside of Photoshop. All right, so I made my sky adjustment. Next thing I wanna do is make a, a, a little bit of a landscape adjustment. I wanna bring up the, the, the contrast and the brightness in the landscape a little bit, but I wanna do that independent of the sky. So again, I need my sky uh, mask, which is still down here in the channels panel, or it's right here on this layer. I can just control click right on that layer to reload it as another selection. And then I can invert the sky selection and that makes it now a land selection. And now I can add that to an adjustment layer. And let's see, I'm gonna do another curves adjustment layer for this one. So my second curves adjustment layer has, instead of a sky mask, it has a land mask. And now I can adjust, let me move this just a little bit more here. I can start working with brightness of the land and contrast in the land using the curve and try to bring in just a little bit of pop, pop and punch into that foreground. I don't wanna go too far with the brightness because that was somewhat soft light. And I may wanna kind of bring up the black levels a little bit in my shadows. I mean, I wanna go full black. So do that there and just work. And the great thing about Photoshop 
and anything that's a non that gives you a non-destructive workflow is you don't have to get it perfect the first time you can come back and rework that and i do that constantly i'm constantly coming back and making fine-tuned adjustments to different um different adjustments that i've done the other thing i can do with curves which is why i use curves is i can also not only work with contrast and brightness i can come into the color channels and work a little bit with color balance so do i want to bring up in the red channel, bring up the red curve a little bit, maybe, and warm up the uh, the highlights a little bit. And this is the highlight side of the histogram. So I may want to bring up the highlights just slightly, not very much. But I also don't want to bring red into the shadow. So I can come down here into the shadow end of the curve and bring that back down to keep that red out of the shadows. And let's see. Yeah, so a little bit of warming. Let's see, bringing the red up just slightly more and bring up, let's see how that looks. Yeah, I think I like that. All right. Yeah, this yeah. is looking great. Yeah, so a couple of, just a few adjustments. And like I said, that image came out of the camera pretty close to how I wanted it. But a few of those adjustments with perspective and filling in some blank edges and then creating a sky selection so I could make some adjustments to my sky and to my landscape. And yeah, I'm gonna call that one good for now. All right. Any any questions on that coming up, Rafa? Nice, nice. Uh, no questions so far. I think we, we forgot to tell people that you guys, you can ask any question. Right. Sean will answer you. So to now, no, no, no questions. People okay, great. Just, uh, watching you work. And I mute my mic because my neighbor is uh, taking a shower now, and <laughs> the wall is is so thin. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you you live in uh, in in a large building in in Madrid, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. lots of neighbors. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Sandra has just popped uh, a question for you. Oh, from, okay. Gidra, uh, yes, uh, Sean, uh, how do you create atmosphere? Yes. Um, how do I create atmosphere is a good question. And again, um, a lot, it goes back to that, that issue of, you know, for me, the photo is about the experience. And so I don't do a lot of creating atmosphere <laughs> and I do a lot of enhancing atmosphere. So if I was able and was fortunate enough to experience atmosphere and have a photograph that has atmosphere in it, which the next image will, uh, then I'll work with the atmosphere that's there. I don't do too much of creating atmosphere. And, you know, so that, and that's also kind of a, uh, you know, different possibilities of what that means, create atmosphere. So in terms of like adding clouds that weren't there um, or bringing in light that wasn't there or, you know, skies that weren't there, that kind of stuff. I really don't do a lot of that in my work. Um, I like to work with the atmosphere that was there. But with that in mind, um, I, I think a lot of the things I do, just the darkening of the sky creates a moodier atmosphere. So if that's the definition of atmosphere, that was a, a really simple uh, example. Let's look at a little more um, uh, kind of a, a different example of something that has more atmosphere in it. Okay, so this image. Uh, lots of atmosphere here. If we're talking about weather atmosphere, <laughs> um, this is up in the uh, the Swiss Alps. We were in a high mountain station. Um, the cloud level was below us, and it was breaking at kind of at dawn. And so the lower mountains were starting to poke through the clouds, and it was just magical, just beautiful atmosphere. Um, so this is the raw file. This is how it came out of the camera. Um, I don't, I, I don't think I made any adjustments in Lightroom to this one yet either. I could, I could do some of this work in Lightroom, but again, a lot of the work that I want to do with this one for atmosphere, uh, is better done for me in Photoshop. So let's get into that. Uh, I, for this, uh, there's a lot of natural highlight and shadow in the clouds and there's a lot of natural kind of, um, uh, 
haze or uh, mistiness in the clouds. And then we've got other areas that are very, you know, sharp uh, that are poking out. We've got colors. We've got kind of cool colors, blues. We've got warm colors, more yellows and oranges. Um, and we've got this wonderful texture that's, you know, co cotton candy and wispy. Um, and then also this kind of harder texture with rock edges and things like that. So I want to work with all of that. And in Photoshop, a lot of what I end up doing to work with all those things I just talked about is a lot of, it's basically ends up being pretty close to painting. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people are, you know, sometimes we call it dodging and burning because in a dark room, when you selectively lighten and darken different parts of an image through darkroom processes. Those were the terms dodging and burning that were used. So that still kind of rolls over into digital developing these days. Um, but there are lots of ways to dodge and burn or to kind of paint light and contrast into an image. And, um, you know, you can do it with mass and, and uh, adjustment layers. Um, and you can also do it with selections and painting with um, different darknesses of brushes and different colors. So I'm gonna show kind of a variety of those techniques to try to bring out not only the atmosphere, but also some dimension and contour and text and create the mood I want out of this image. So the first thing I'm gonna do is start with just a simple way to work with some of this. And that's just, again, levels or curves and actually um, levels does a lot of the same things that curves does, but in this case, it's a little easier. I can just really quickly increase, I mean, can bring up the brights, so make my brights brighter, and kind of close to the edge of histogram. I don't want to blow out full white, I don't think. You can see some of these areas start getting hot. So somewhere in here, and I can also work contrast a little bit with the midtones. I could go with the blacks, but I'm gonna leave the black point kind of alone for now. And so, there's that levels adjustment, but it's a global adjustment. It goes across the whole image. I want to selectively paint that adjustment in. So I'm going to basically do dodging or contrast dodging with that adjustment by turning this into a black mask, which lots of ways to get a black mask. It's already a white mask, so I could just invert the mask is an easy way or I could get rid of a white mask and add a black mask. Lots of ways to do everything in Photoshop. Easy way to invert a mask is Control or Command I on the mask, or in um, in the panel, this is the invert button. So I just click that and it'll invert it from black to white. And then I grab a white paintbrush and I'm gonna go full opacity, 100% opacity, but my flow on the paintbrush, I'm gonna take down to uh, 20%. So. I can kind of airbrush that in uh, onto the mass with a white brush and incrementally build it up where I paint. And then I should be using a very, yeah, full feathered soft brush and I can change my brush, brush size. So now areas where I want to kind of bring in that contrast, I can just start painting white. So this area and this area, and this is really fun. I love doing this is just being able to choose where I want these highlights to come in and how I want those to come out. And I, if I want more of it to come through, I paint more. If I want less to come through, I paint less. And I'm just kind of looking at where the natural highlights in the image are already. Also maybe on this rock here a little bit. And nice. Sean, will we be able to see the, the before and after image when you were finished? Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Um, all right. So this is, I'm just kind of setting the initial foundation here. Um, yeah. And this is where, again, I could spend hours <laughs> doing this, but you get the idea. So here's my mask. So this is just freehand painting on the mask, very sloppy painting, but the, a lot of what's being put in there is being controlled by that adjustment. And I can, of course, go back in and fine tune that adjustment as well. Now that I have the mask to really get it looking just how I want in terms of the contouring. And so that's before the adjustment and that's after the adjustment. So, so far, yeah, great. That's a good start. The other thing that I want to do, I think, is um, 
darken. You know, that was really kind of brightening and adding contrast into some areas. I want to direct the eye towards the center of the scene. So I want to do some darkening. Um, and I'm going to do that with an adjustment layer as well. That last one I did with a, a levels. This one, I'm going to use a curves and go back to that same adjustment that we did before, just dragging the middle of that curve down um, to darken everything. And I don't know how much yet. I'll just leave it there for now. But again, global adjustment does not look good on the whole image. So that's not the adjustment I want to make everywhere. So I'm going to invert the mask again, make it a black mask and paint with a white brush. And now instead of painting in the bright areas, I can come through and paint a little darkness into areas that kind of were dark already. And what I'm trying to do here is create kind of a natural vignette. So darkening the edges helps bring out the center of the image more. So even though I haven't brightened the center of the image yet, it looks brighter just by darkening the, out, the outside. So already going from here to here with just a couple of real simple adjustments and some very simple hand painted masking, you know, very childlike painting on those masks. You can really see how that's bringing out a lot of great shape and contour. Um, now that's kind of one way of uh, dodging and burning, I guess, or lightening and darkening. I don't know what to call that really. I, sometimes I'll call it, um, you know, like contrast painting or who knows what, but uh, that's an easy, simple way. But sometimes I want even more control over my painting on an image than that. I want to really work tonally. And you see that there's all these great soft tones and textures in the clouds. And, you know, it's really hard to paint those exactly. But if I could have something that could help me kind of guide my painting, that would be really helpful. Uh, I'm not a great painter. <laughs> and that's where something like a luminosity mask can come in. And a luminosity mask is a mask just like these are masks. And we, as we've seen, masks are black and white and shades of gray. These so far have been paint, uh, based on where I painted. The one in the previous example was based on a selection that I made of the sky. But what if I could make a mask that was based on the brightness values of the image? That's what luminosity masks are. So the Go module of the TK panel creates luminosity masks and other types of pixel-based masks. Now, this is a little interesting thing. I love to teach about this um, because really, I mean, a, a digital image looks so complicated and complex. And how do you even make a digital image? Well, the reality is, is that they're really simple. I'm going to grab the, uh, the zoom tool here and just zoom way in. And if you zoom in far enough, you no longer see a picture. What you see is individual pixels. And if you put together several million of those pixels all together, they make a, an image. But when you zoom in on the pixel level, you don't see that. You just see the pixels. And every pixel is made up of three values. That's it. Every image, digital image, boils down to three things. How bright the pixel is, what color the pixel is, or what hue it is, and how saturated it is. So those three things, brightness, hue, saturation, are the only three things involved in a digital image. That's it. And every pixel has its own set of instructions for how bright, what color, and how saturated to be. And so if you can make a mask based on the values from the pixels, that mask can be really useful. And that's what a luminosity mask is. If we take the, the, the saturation and the color out of these pixels, and just look at the brightness values, we'd have a black and white image and each pixel will be a different shade of gray. And if we then can make a mask based on those brightness values, that's a luminosity mask. So let's do that. Let's get back out here. So there's the whole image, all those millions of pixels working together. And uh, when I click this source button in the module, because making luminosity masks by hand, it takes forever back in 2006 when 
Tony Kuiper first kind of introduced the landscape photography world to luminosity masks. We were making them by hand and very few people wanted to do it because it was a pain in the butt. <laughs> so that's why Tony started making panels that would make the masks for you because <laughs> realistically, nobody's going to spend the time or very few people are going to spend the time doing it by hand. So, very clever, Tony. What's that? Very, very clever, Tony. Very well, Tony, yeah, right. that's the thing. Tony is, uh, he, Tony's many things, but he is very clever. Yeah, so <laughs> thank you to Tony for pioneering all of this for us. Um, otherwise, I don't think any of us would be doing it. All right, so when I click this source button, this is the luminosity mass source button in his panel. Other panels work different ways. Um, this is the one I know. And it starts with a luminosity mask. That's what this is. We're looking at a luminosity mask. This is a preview of it. It looks like a black and white image because that's what it is. And all we're seeing here are the brightness values of each pixel. So masks are black and white in shades of gray. So if I can turn these brightness values into a mask, that'll be an amazingly detailed mask that matches the Im image pixel for pixel, but it also feathers with these tones perfectly. So that's a mask that I could never paint by hand. So let's do that. I'm going to use this mask, but actually I'm not going to use it as a mask on a layer like these masks. I'm going to use the mask instead as a selection. And the reality is, is that selections and masks in Photoshop are two sides of the same coin. Any mask can become a selection and any selection be can become a mask. We already saw that with the sky selection. I turned it into a mask. Well, here we have a luminosity mask. I want to turn it into a selection. And in the panel, once you have a mask selected, then this button right here in the output section outputs it as a selection. But before I output, I actually want to um, I want to refine it a little bit. I want to slightly, it's a lights one mask right now is what we're looking at. I want it a little more targeted just towards the lights. So I'm going to click the two lights and that's a, a lights two mask and it's more targeted to just those brightest areas. And then I, in the modify section, I can modify it a little bit. I actually wanna make those bright areas a little brighter so that the adjustment that I'm gonna do will come through more. The lighter area in the mask, the more it lets the adjustment through. So I'm bring that up, maybe something like that. And once I have the mask looking how I want it, I'm gonna output it, that's section three. This time I'm gonna output it as a selection. And there is a selection there. You don't see it because the panel automatically hides it for us. But these little red dots let us know that we have an active selection. And if I want to see it, this button will show it to me. And there they are. You can see the selection lines. They really don't show us what is really selected, which is they're just distracting, which is why the panel hides them for us. We don't want to see them. And now I want to paint through that selection. I want to paint lightness through that selection. So. It's kind of like light painting. Tony calls it luminosity painting. And the way I'm gonna do that is on a dodge layer. Now, dodge and burn layers are a very common thing in Photoshop. Instead of using the dodge and burn tools in Photoshop, which you can only do on pixels, and then once you save it, you can't undo those pixel changes. Using a dodge or burn layer allows you to have uh, a non-destructive workflow or maintain that non-destructive workflow, you can undo them at any point, just like any other adjustment layer. Now, uh, to make a, a, a dodge or burn layer by hand, what you have to do is add an empty layer, um, you know, so an empty layer and then give it a, a different blending mode. And you can go online. There's all kinds of tutorials if you don't know how to do that um, for making your own dodge and burn layers. I use the panel because again, with one click, I can just make a dodge layer. It's right there. I just click that. What it does is it makes the empty layer, it sets the blending mode, it picks the right brush, it sets it to white because it knows I want to dodge. And now with one click, I'm ready to go. And I still have that selection. And Nick Page came up with this explanation of what I'm going to do here. And he even said it in the master class he did for PhotoPills, which is he says, using the selection like a stencil. And that's the best explanation that I've ever heard of it. So I use it now. Thanks, Nick. I just steal that from you. Um, so that selection is like a stencil. And so wherever I paint, the selection is going to control where I can put that white paint. So in these light areas, because I selected for those light tones, 
that's where my paint's gonna go. If I come over here into these dark tones and try to paint, notice nothing's happening because the stencil is closed off there. So no paint can go through. Whereas out here in these lighter areas, it will allow the paint to go through and it's letting different amounts of paint go through based on how bright the image was. And that's the luminosity part of this. So in this way, I'm not lightening everything. I'm only lightening the lightest areas and the lighter it is, the more it's getting and the less light it is, the less it's getting. So in that way, like I can lighten up this mist in front of the mountains, which are dark behind it. So I'm not lightening the mountains. I'm just lightening the mist. And so this luminosity painting allows me to really have a lot of control over how I'm bringing that in. Now, I, you know, I was really pushing it there. I can make creative decisions about if I like what I did. And if I don't, I could take an eraser tool and erase some of that painting, or I can work with the opacity of that layer to just dial in the exact amount I want. So that's doing light painting dodging, something I also call cloud sculpting. If I'm doing it on clouds, it's all the same thing. <laughs> cloud sculpting, I thought sounded cool. Light painting or luminosity painting sounds cool. It's all about how cool the name is. All right, so now I'm gonna do more luminosity painting or cloud sculpting, but this time I wanna do it in the shadows. So I'll go back to my luminosity mask source and instead of choosing a lights mask, this time I'm gonna choose a darks mask and look for a darks mask that will protect these areas that are bright because I don't wanna darken the bright areas with my burning. I just wanna darken the areas that are already somewhat dark and increase that. that. So I think this, um, this darks two is probably gonna do a good job of that. I could modify it if I wanted to, but I don't think I need to. So I'm just gonna load it as a selection. And then this time, instead of a dodging layer, I'm gonna make a burning layer. So there's my burning layer and the panel has already selected a black brush for me and set the, uh, the blending mode where I want it. And I'm doing this, oh, that was a flow of 20%. I'm gonna take that down to 10% flow so I can really do this very delicately. And you can see that again, it's not darkening the light areas at all, but it is bringing a little more contrast into the dark areas, but it's really doing it with a lot of contour and shape. And awesome, okay. So again, more vignetting. Some of these dark areas make them nice and dark. Let's see how that looks. So there's that luminosity burning. Let's see how we're doing with this image. So there's the flat started raw file. And there I'm bringing in some contour and drama and some dimension and atmosphere to this image. The last thing I wanna do with this image at this point is highlight the rock in the center. Uh, I want that a little brighter, a little more eye catching, a little more eye drawing. So I think I'm gonna do that with a curves adjustment layer. And this one, I'm just gonna start with just a global curves adjustment layer. And I'm gonna use the selective uh, or the targeted uh, adjustment tool here. So I can actually do it right out here. I want these highlights on the image to come up and get nice and bright without overexposing them. And nice. I, what's that? Nice, nice. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's kind of fun. Yeah. A fun tool. And then I don't want to lighten my shadows quite that much. And I want to increase. So I'm going to click in the shadows and just pull those down a little bit. So I want to bring those shadows up a bit, but I also want to maintain some amount of contrast. But yeah, definitely brighter there. Okay, so I'm, I'm liking that. And I may also, I think I want to um, come into my blue channel. And again, I could do this with the target adjustment tool. I want these bright highlights out here to be a little warmer, a little more yellow. So for there, I'm gonna click and drag down. The opposite of blue is yellow. So bring in a little yellow. And I'll come down here in the shadows because I want those to stay a little bluer. So click and drag up because the op or because blue is the upward direction in that blue channel. And let's see, I may have gone a little too yellow so I can fine tune that a little bit. Let's see how that looks. Yeah, I like it. I'm just looking in this center area. So now I'm gonna add a black mask. I'll just invert the mask to black. And now with a white brush, I'm just gonna freehand paint 
because I really just want to bring up, oh, let's go up above, let's take it up to 20% so I can really bring that in a little more in the center area and kind of just through here. So bringing out that central area and uh, I don't want to lighten the clouds out around the edge too much. So I can go back to a black brush and small and just kind of feather it in kind of around here. And I don't think I need any sort of a luminosity selection or anything for that. Let's see how that's looking. Yeah, so kind of bringing out that center area a little bit. All right, so let's see how that looks. Here's the beginning and there's the end. And most of that was all through painting in adjustments. I was painting on the image, very painterly way of working, which I love to do. How are we doing on, on time, Rafa? Are we still going or? We're still going. Actually, we have a few questions. Do you want to answer them? Absolutely. Time, time for answering questions. We have uh, Leon Flack. Uh, why did you do it in channels and not extra layers? Yeah, I think it refers to the, to the first photo. The first photo, you mean yeah. saving the, the sky selection in channel? Yeah, I think so, yeah. The, so that sky selection is just, it, now that you have the Photoshop select sky feature, which is just one click, it's really easy to make a sky selection if it is the right sky selection for what you need. But if it's not the right sky selection, or if you're not using that sky select feature, it can take sometimes to get a really good, perfect uh, sky selection. It can take a long time. Mm -hmm. So saving a selection as a channel like that is how I can get it back easily in the future without having to remake it again from scratch. Um, there's no way to save a selection in a layer per se, unless it's a mask. So yeah, if I've got that selection as a mask, it's there, save there. But sometimes I'll modify a mask or I won't use it as a mask right away. Just early on, as soon as I start, I'll just make a sky selection and I know I'm gonna use it eventually. So I save it as a channel in the channels panel and that way I can get it back when I'm ready for it. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. Another question uh, from Miguel Angel Martí. Sorry, what about the color theory? Do you change colors a little bit to match them? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. So in this image, uh, I already pointed out, you know, there are some um, some cools and some warms and uh, some other colors. And I didn't really work with color at all. Just working off of the color, basically the raw color at this point. You know, I didn't even do anything with color, white balance or any of that in, in Lightroom ahead of time. Um, so certainly a part of my overall workflow would be to come in here and consider color. And yeah, I probably would want to play off of the cools that are in the shadow and the warms in the clouds, and then maybe also do some other color balancing in other areas in the image. Um, but I've, I, I want to kind of work incrementally from basic to more advanced. So we're going to come back to the color ideas on the next image. I'm going to show really quickly some cool kind of um, color grading ideas but they would apply to this image and the first one as well. Oh, and in the first one, I actually did do a little bit of color. I just warmed up those highlights in the foreground a little bit with you know, real simple. Um, and yeah, so, but let's get to a bigger overall color balance idea. Any more questions? Okay, uh, yes, uh, from Joe Aveni. Uh, Sin, do you prefer using curves over levels in Photoshop? <laughs> the age old question, levels or curves, which one's better? I actually have a whole video on my YouTube channel about that, uh, levels or curves, which one's better. Um, so check that out if you really wanna you know, take a deep dive into it. But here's the, um, here's the short answer, as short as I can make it. I don't make anything short if you guys haven't noticed by now. Rafa knows that about me. <laughs> um, is that, um, that's because you're a great teacher. Uh, is that may, what it is? Yeah. Uh, or maybe oh, because you're like uh, a, bit, a bit older. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, the short, the short story is, is that, um, levels can do, or sorry, curves can do everything levels can do. Levels can't do everything that curves can do. 
So in a lot of ways, depending on what you're doing, they're the same. There's really no real advantage one over the other. Um, but curves has many things you can do with curves that you can't do in levels. So if you had to make a choice, if you only had one, you had to pick one and be stuck with it the rest of your life, it's curves. Curves can do everything, whereas levels has some limitations. But sometimes ahead of time, I know what I'm going to do with it. And I know that levels can do what I need. And levels is just a little sometimes faster and easier. So if I know that ahead of time that I don't need some of the curves functionality, I'll use levels just to keep my life simple. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want, we can answer another one before you move on. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we have uh, the same question from Chris uh, Wheaton and uh, Vincenzo Sidero. Uh, can you compare Tony Cooper's panels with uh, Luminenzia? Any thoughts? Uh, which one? Uh, what are the difference? So uh, I uh, I can't really compare because I have never used Luminenzia. I've never used um, the I think Raya Pro. There's I'm. When Tony first made his panel, it was the only one for luminosity mass that I knew about back then. Um, then uh, I think those two came on at some point after that. And nowadays, I think if you did a search, I think there are tons and tons of luminosity panels out there. I haven't used any of the other ones, so I can't speak to them specifically. Uh, I watched a few of um, uh, Greg and Jimmy's videos, and so I can kind of see what they're doing. And one thing I do know... Um, a little bit is that somewhat, I think, especially Jimmy's panel is based around Jimmy's workflow. Mm -hmm. So he's designed a panel that he, he does things a certain way. And so he's created tools that help him do the things the way he does them. So I would say, I guess, if you do things the way Jimmy does them, then his panel is probably pretty good for that. Um, Tony really wants to make his panel very... Uh, First of all, user-friendly, number one. Number two, very open-ended. So mm -hmm. the idea is to provide tools, not prescribe a, a method or tell you, if you're gonna use this tool, you have to do it this way. His tool can work with wh whatever method that you use. Um, it's very open-ended in that way. And so that's what I can say about the TK panel. Um, beyond that, I think they probably do a lot of the same things, uh, especially the luminosity masking part of it in terms of making mass, modifying mass, applying mass. Um, so it may just come down to what your preference is. I don't know how many other panels have like a combo module that allows you, you know, kind of like that control module, control center. Um, I really love that. I mean, in fact, a lot of times this module is closed, the luminosity mask module is closed because if I'm not making a luminosity mask, I don't need it open, taking up space. So I just close that. But this module, I leave open 100% of the time because I never go more than a couple of seconds without using it because I'm using that instead of all these menus up here. Awesome. Thank you for answering the questions. And if you want to move on to the next uh, Final yeah. image for learning yeah, we'll, a few more techniques. Let's see what we got here. Yeah, um, if I have one, if I do one, do I have time to do one real fast just to talk about color? Awesome. Maybe do the final one, which kind of brings a bunch of things together. Awesome. Okay, yeah. we have time for that. For sure, and uh, you know, all the people in the uh, watching, uh, they know that this is going to be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. So. Perfect. Stay here all day long. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to edit in Photoshop. Let me get into Photoshop with this guy here. Okay. Next image. So this image, I'm going to do some 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 color grading. Um, and a lot of time, I mean, there's lots of different ways to color grade and work with color palettes and things like that in, in Photoshop or in just any kind of image editing. Um, a common one that we see a lot is called split toning, where you take the, uh, you know, the bright tones, the lighter tones in an image, and you give them one kind of color cast, like maybe a warm color. And then you take the darker tones and you give them a different color cast. And we have a lot of this naturally in just natural light anyway. So that highlights with direct sunlight tend to be warmer, shadows tend to be cooler. So we wanna kind of work with that. 
And in Lightroom, there's a, a split toning tool in Lightroom. And now, in fact, in, in um, Lightroom and Camera Raw, there's a new color grading feature that came in October. And these can be great. Um, I find I don't have the kind of control with them that I wanna have. And so I tend to work in Photoshop. Um, so this split toning idea combined with luminosity mass for this image, what I wanna do really quickly without worrying about any of the other editing that I would do to this image, just color only, is I want to warm up the highlights on my snow because the sun was over here and it was getting late in the day. So it was very warm light that was on the snow. And then the shadows in the snow were very cool and blue. There's no one white balance I can pick for the image. If I warm up the highlights, then my shadows get too warm. If I cool down the shadows, then my highlights get too cool. So that's where split toning comes in. So I want to start by warming up my highlights. So I could try to you know, make a, a warming adjustment and then paint it in by hand. But of course, that would be a real pain <laughs> to try to accomplish that. Um, so instead of what I'm going to do is create a luminosity mask that will allow me to target that adjustment to the highlights. So let's find a mask that will do that. So here's a lights one mask and it definitely is selecting the highlights, but it's also going into the shadows quite a bit. Let's check out a lights two, definitely better separation between the highlights and the shadows, a three, a lot of separation, but now even my highlights are getting pretty dark. Another thing I can do is check different channels for uh, the different color channels. Remember in the channels panel, uh, any color image is made up of a red, a green, and a blue channel. And actually the, the opposite of red is cyan, the opposite of green is magenta, and the opposite of blue is yellow. So the panel actually gives us the ability to make mass based on the red, the green, or the blue channels or even though there aren't channels for them, the panel knows how to make uh, masks for the cyan, magenta, and yellow channels if there were such channels. Um, okay, so let's just take a look. I'm gonna go back to the two and see, is there maybe a color channel that will highlight the, yeah, that definitely highlighted the highlights, but the blue channel goes even more into the shadows. Yeah, I'm not seeing, sometimes, oh, actually the yellow, wow, okay. The yellow channel did a better job, I think, than the composite. Let me see, that's the composite. Ah, it's pretty close, actually. So sometimes one of these color channels will make a mask that does a much better job of getting what I want. And that's the beauty of the of luminosity mask with the panel is you don't have to, it doesn't matter which one it is. The only thing that matters is, is it the mask that's gonna do the job you want it to do? And then however you get there is beside the point. Anyway, uh, I, that's pretty good. Another thing I can do uh, with the with the panel is check zones. So maybe there's a zone luminosity that's a narrow range of tonal values that would work better that's just closer to that tone right there. So I picked that tone in the bright highlight of the snow. This is the color picker, but it's not picking a color. It's, if you notice, it's only just picking that tone with no saturation. And that's the mask of that tone. Now that is more what I was looking for. So in this case, that narrow uh, zone mask, and that's the zone it picked. You can see right there, it's close to what is called a zone seven. I'm just gonna check to see is a zone six. No, that's going the wrong direction. How about a zone eight? No, I think that zone seven probably is the right one. Uh, yeah, let's go with it. All right, so there's my mask. I've created my mask. Now I'm gonna output this. I don't have a, a layer already to use it with. I don't want a selection. I wanna output this to a new layer. So in the output section, I can choose curves, levels, brightness, contrast, hue, saturation, or photo filter, or oh, I always forget, there's dodge and burn layer buttons right here. I use these over here. These work too. <laughs> um, anyway, I actually want, uh, let's see, I'm gonna do this with, cur or, yeah, with curves again. Curves is great because it gives you control over both color balance and brightness and contrast. So it's kind of almost like two adjustments for the price of one. So I'm gonna go into the color channels, but here's that mask. 
So the brightest areas are going to get most of the adjustment. And I'm going to go into the color channels and I'm going to start with the blue yellow. And in those highlights, I'm going to go opposite of blue is yellow. So let's add some yellow into those highlights. And that may be too much, but we'll start with that. I'm going to come back to the red and I'm going to add red into the highlights as well. So there's the red. And let's go to green, magenta, and let's see, do I want any magenta? You know, I could go really crazy with that. Uh, maybe just barely a little magenta. And the other thing is, do I want to try to fade this adjustment off so that, but the mask is really controlling a lot of that, so I probably don't need to fade the cyan in the shadows, really. So I'm gonna leave that out for now. Now, that's a pretty strong adjustment. Let me also come back to the RGB channel here and also just find out, you know, what's the brightness and contrast I want for that adjustment. And let's take a look. So that's the color adjustment I'm making to the highlights. And I, I made it a little strong on purpose because then I can always work with the opacity of that layer to dial in just how much of it I want after the fact. So let's say somewhere in there maybe is more what I want, but I'm gonna leave it at full strength so we can also just really see it in the feed and also show you if I didn't have that mask controlling my highlights, what would it look like? So if I turn off the mask, whoop, I gotta get on the mask. If I turn off the mask, yikes, <laughs> that's what warming up the highlights to that degree would do to the rest of the image. Looks horrible. But with that mask controlling it, it's a really nice warming up of the highlights. And already we can see the natural cool colors in the shadows that were there already. So this image may not even need any, um, you know, shadow cooling, but let's say I want to work with the shadow colors a little bit anyway. So I'm gonna come back up to my zone because I think again, using the zone picker for this and just picking that tone in the shadowed snow is gonna get us the, the best result. Let's see, that's the three. I wonder about maybe the two, uh, somewhere between a two and a three I think is right. And then of course I can further, if I wanna protect the highlights make those a little darker again. I can bring that over. Yeah, let's try that. And for this one, instead of a curves adjustment, I'm gonna just to mix things up to show you different tools in Photoshop and that you have those options. That's one of the great things about photo. Another great thing about Photoshop is that you have many different ways to approach the same problem. So if one's not getting you what you want, you have other options. Whereas a lot of, um, uh, editing apps, you know, you've got one slider and that's your option. And if you try it and it isn't working, that's, you're out of luck after that. So Photoshop gives you lots of options. So hue saturation is what I'm going to try with this mask. So I'll put that mask that targets the shadows to this hue saturation adjustment layer. And let's just work with the hue. So with the hue and the shadows, working that hue slider, I can make the shadows kind of greener, and go more magenta. And yeah, maybe kind of a, a more magenta-y blue shadow. And I can also work with the, the lightness slider if I wanna bring the brightness of my shadows down a little bit. And I can work with the saturation if I don't wanna oversaturate those shadows. I might even bring the saturation down a little bit. And let's see. Yeah, so there's some color grading in those shadows. And so that's where we started. And that's where we ended. So there's working with color this time instead of brightness and contrast. Uh, and again, with luminosity mask to guide it because I feel like, again, I get much more control that way. Awesome. Okay, cool. So there's a little color work. Any more questions or should we move on to the final, the final countdown? Let's move on to the final uh, image and then we, we can answer a few more you want. Okay, so the last image here, I just want to kind of bring everything together and also add in a couple more things. <laughs> so we'll get this open. Oh, we we'll still have uh, 610 brave. Brave souls that are hanging out, hanging yeah. in. Awesome, thanks for being here, everybody. <laughs> Thank All right. you. How, how are you doing, Rafa? You're still awake? I'm awake. You know, I'm not a photographer, but I'm enjoying. I'm trying. I'm learning new things. 
<laughs> All right. Well, good. That's the goal. Great. Hopefully, everyone is. If, if you, if everyone, if if you can take away one thing, I hope, uh, then it's hopefully worth your time. All right. So here's this image. We saw this image earlier uh, when I talked about the fire and of uh, Mount Jefferson, and this is the raw file. So this is how my camera saw the scene. Not at all what I saw, not at all what my hope of communicating my experience uh, is. So, you know, my camera failed as being the artist this time, as it often does, because it's just a tool. So I want to work with this and let's just kind of go through the whole workflow. So the first thing I would do here is look and see, is there anything that I need to deal with pixel wise, you know, any perspective changes, any transformations, any cleanup in terms of, uh, you know, cloning out things or healing things or that kind of stuff. And in this case, I got my camera level for a change when I took the photo. So it feels level. I didn't have to point it down too much. So I don't have too much wide angle distortion. Um, and it wasn't that wide angle of a shot. And um, I don't see, I think I managed to not have dust spots on my camera. So I think it's pretty good from that regard. So I don't need to deal with any of that stuff. Um, now I opened this image instead of just a normal uh, image in Photoshop, I opened it as a smart object from the raw file. And this is another is something I haven't talked about yet, but being able to open raw files as smart objects in Photoshop does an amazing thing. Now it isn't always useful and it does have its downsides. And in fact, that's my next course that's coming out. It should be, hopefully be out in the next several weeks is all on smart objects and using smart objects in landscape photography. Um, there are some downsides to them, but there are some great upsides. So in the right situation, they're great to use and I'm gonna use them in this situation. So the reason I open it as a smart object is because I want to make raw adjustments to this image, but through experience, I found that there's no one set of raw adjustments that gets everything in the image how I want it. So if I get the sky looking how I like it, then the landscape doesn't look right. And if I get the landscape how I like it, then the sky doesn't look right. And if I try to use Lightroom's um, localized adjustment tools like the gradient or the adjustment brush, I can't get a refined enough selection to separate out the parts of the image. So I'm actually gonna use this as two raw files layered together so that I can have one part of my image with one set of raw adjustments that are perfect for that. And the other part of the image from a different raw, or it's the same raw file, but a different set of raw instructions for that part. So to do that, I need to make a copy of my raw file. It's a single exposure. I only took one exposure, so it's not dual exposures. It's just dual copies of the single image. And to make a copy of a smart object that stays a smart object, you have to use. Um, oh, I hate <laughs> this is why this is why I hate uh, the menus is because finding things is tricky. Um, in the, uh, where uh, new smart object be a copy. I'm not even finding it here. I know it's in here. Uh, let's go here. Um, why am I not even finding it? It's usually right here. New smart object. Oh, uh, here it is. New. <laughs> this is the problem with menus. Even when you know where something is, it takes you forever to find it. So new smart object via copy will make a copy of that smart object that's separate from this copy so I can have two different sets of raw adjustments. And as luck would have it, <laughs> the reason why... I hate finding it in the, in the menu, is this button right here just does that. So I just click that and I have a copy and this copy will enable me to make a different set of raw adjustments than this copy. And the other thing I need is a sky selection so that I can separate the two. So I'm gonna just do that right now and get that out of the way. Select sky, let's try Photoshop sky selection thinks about it for a minute, there it is. And you'll notice that it's not only selected the sky, but it's decided that the snow is part of the sky. <laughs> Photoshop's not perfect. And in some situations, uh, that confusion on Photoshop's part may be problematic. But in this case, actually, the colors in the sky are being reflected in the snow. 
So I actually want some of those adjustments in the sky to spill over onto the snow. So I'm actually okay with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that as a channel, call my sky channel so I can get it back when I'm ready for it. Okay, and I can deselect that now because now it's down here in my sky channel where I can get it. Okay, now um, this top layer is gonna be my sky layer. So I'm gonna double click on it and it opens that raw file up in camera raw slowly. <laughs> Here's camera raw which is the same as Lightroom, all the same adjustments as Lightroom. And so I can now decide, I'm gonna look at the sky and the snow. What do I want that to look like? So I'm gonna, um, let's see, I may wanna bring the highlights in the sky down a little bit. Uh, I usually end up darkening my skies. That's one of the things I often do in a lot of my landscape images. Um, Sean, are you on Photoshop or Camera Row? Say again? Are you on Photoshop, on Photoshop working? Oh, <laughs> darn <laughs> screenshot. Thank you, Rafa. So, um, I'm still awake. Yeah, yes, you are. Uh, I'm looking at camera raw. What's the wrong, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so I think what I have to do now for this, so everyone's gonna have to bear with me. Yeah. I'm gonna have to share my whole screen so that you can actually see camera raw. Cause I was sharing Photoshop and it doesn't think that uh, Photoshop it, or Camera Raw is part of Photoshop. Here we okay, are. so here's my whole monitor. That's what I'm not showing everyone, all this stuff out here. So here's Camera Raw. So I know that's small, but I'm just gonna do a couple of things. We okay with that? Uh, you wanna maximize it? Uh, uh, no, let's, this, this is just quick. Um, okay. I think it'll be okay. These are just some camera adjustments. So what I've done with this so far is in camera raw, this is the actual raw information. I'm gonna bring down the highlights in the sky and I'm just, I'm, this is happening to the whole image, but I'm, this is my sky adjustment. So I'm looking at the sky. So I'm gonna bring down my sky a little bit. Uh, I'm going to, let's see, I definitely need some more color in the sky. So I'm gonna bring up vibrance a bit. And instead of saturation, I like to use the, the calibration. I know this is something that a lot of people are doing these days. Actually, bringing up the saturation in the blue primary in the raw data is a cleaner way of increasing saturation. And you've got the green and the red channels as well that you can work with, but oftentimes the blue does what we need. Um, and I can also come into the color mixer here and work a little bit with the, um, Let's see, I wanna work with the luminance of the aquas here and kind of bring down this area out here, kind of darken that part of the sky. And I also wanna change the hue of that. I don't really like the hue that I'm getting there. I want those aquas to be more close to the rest of the blues. And I may want the blues to be slightly warmer, a little more magenta. Okay. Uh, and then let's see. Now, the other thing is I'm gonna lighten this foreground quite a bit in the other smart object. And so I want that to blend in kind of in that transition zone. So I am gonna bring up the shadows, even though this isn't the exposure that, my, or the, the copy that my shadows are gonna come from, but I'm just gonna get it closer. I'm looking at the mountain. How do I want that mountain to look in the final image? So I'm working with contrast, I'm working with shadows, and I can even work with the overall exposure slightly and maybe somewhere in there is where I want it. So I'm gonna say okay to that and let that update back here in Photoshop. So that's my start. Now I'm gonna to go to the background, the foreground copy of my smart object. I think Sean, I think if you can share the Photoshop uh, well, window. I will as soon as I, I'm gonna do one more set of uh, camera raw. Should I just, I don't even know if it'll pick up camera raw at all. Let me see if it even picks it up, if I can share just camera raw. Uh, yeah, see, that's what I was worried about. It doesn't, um, this, the whatever the, the app we're using is, doesn't even recognize that camera raw is an app. So I can't share just camera raw. Okay. So this is the best we got. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, so in camera raw for this foreground, I know that I wanna bring the ad exposure way up and show that detail. 
I want to bring up some shadow detail. I want to bring up the black point a little bit, watching my histogram so I'm not clipping my blacks. Um, bring down the highlights quite a bit. And maybe somewhere in there. And again, I may want to bring up some vibrance, bring a little color into that foreground and come down to calibration and bring in a little blue saturation into the foreground. We'll say that's good for now. I'd spend quite a bit of time working on that. And we let that update. So here now is my set of adjustments for the sky. Here's my set of adjustments for the foreground. And now I want to apply that sky mass that I made to that to blend those two together. So I'm gonna select that sky selection, get it back. And now I just need to add a mask to this top layer and that mask will allow the top parts of this one and the bottom parts of this one to be blended together. We'll see how that looks. <laughs> Here it goes. So I add a mask and the mask, the selection becomes the mask, there it is. And let's see how it looks. So yeah, so now I can get that sky selection that I wanted or the sky adjustment that I wanted combined with the foreground adjustment that I wanted. And it looks pretty good. I noticed there's some, um, some kind of contrast issues in this transition zone that I would keep going back to those raw files a few more times to really dial them in together. All right, so let's now go to just Photoshop. Uh, just Photoshop here. Okay. You're becoming becoming a master of this live stream. <laughs> yes. <laughs> are we back to Photoshop now? There we are. Okay, yeah. just Photoshop. You don't have to see my messy desktop. Okay. Um, all right. So now, like I said, if we if, if this was a four-hour live stream instead of, uh, you know, what are we coming up on, two hours here, I'd spend more time on this. But uh, let's not do that right at this moment. But I would get that two exposure or the two copies really looking good together. But then once I've gotten to this point, I can now continue working with this in Photoshop with Photoshop adjustments uh, as if it came out of my camera this way, as if I was able to accomplish this with a single, um, just a single frame. So what kinds of things might I do from this point going forward? Well, one is I definitely think I actually want my sky even a little darker than that. So I could go back to the raw and darken it from there, or I can use my sky selection, oh, which actually now is out here. So I can just select it from there. And let's add a curves adjustment layer to that and just darken that upper part of the image a bit there. And yeah, I can see I'm gonna have to go back to, you're not gonna, you guys aren't gonna see this, but I'm gonna just really quickly go back to the raw file because I can see that I'm not getting the right exposure to blend from the underneath exposure. So that one's going to have to get a little more contrast in it and be just a little darker there, a little more shadow recovery down there. Let's try that. That might get us closer. There we go. That's looking a little better. Okay. And then from here, I would start working with a lot of those other things that I've been showing in previous adjustments. So I darkened the sky a little bit and uh, I'm going to add a burn layer because I want to just ask myself, what do I think the image needs now? One of the things is this foreground's too bright for me. So I'm gonna just do some freehand burning just to darken this foreground a bit. And I also wanna darken this corner of the sky a little bit with that burning. And yeah, get a little more balance in the light and a little more direction. The sun was over here, so I want that light to be streaming in from the side like it actually was. Uh, next, I want to do some, actually, I want to do a little more burning right in the center here as well, just across the mountain. This area feels like it needs just a bit more. All right, that now is looking much better. And that's just freehand burning at this point. The next thing I want to do is bring in some light into this foreground area that's a little dark here where the light is hitting the tops of the trees and also in the area of the sky where that light source was coming from and as it's streaming across there. So let's see if I can find a luminosity selection that will target that where I want it. Uh, go to a light selection and that's a lights one. That's pretty close. Um, 
let's see if I just lighten up the light selection a little bit. And so, yeah, my snow, the highlights on the mountain, the tips of the trees are going to get the adjustment where all these dark areas of trees and dark rocks and things won't, and the sky will get it some too. So I'm going to load that as a selection. So I've got that selection loaded and I'm going to dodge. So I'm going to make a dodge layer. But this time, instead of dodging with white paint, I'm going to dodge with colored paint because I want to bring in the actual color of light that's coming, which is the sunrise warm color over here. So I'm going to sample that color, get up here, fairly bright, fairly not too saturated in this case. And I may, well, let's see. I don't know if I want to go a little more yellow. We'll find out. So I'll pick that color for my brush color. And now with that selection active, there's the selection. Painting with a stent as a stencil, I can start brushing that light into the snow, across the mountain, and into the trees down here. And it's just because of the stencil going to the highlights in the trees, the highlights on the mountain, and the highlights whoop, in the sky across here, and on this peak over here that's getting that nice warm light, and a little bit into the foreground. Something like that. So a little color dodging. And I can see in a couple areas it's having an effect on the snow I don't like. So I can just grab the eraser tool and just erase that out of there where I don't like it. And even a little bit up here. So just backing that off. That's why this is non-destructive. And let's see, what else do I think? Of course, spending more time on this. I can also see here, I can go back to my burn layer, grab a black brush again, deselect my selection. I do want to darken this part of the mountain a little bit more just because that's not getting direct light. And let's see how that's looking. Yeah, so that's that color dodging. The other thing I probably would do is on another dodge layer, just do a little bit of white dodging this time in here. Too much. Let's take that down to 5% opac or flow. So I can just bring in just a little bit of highlighting into the foreground. And this is just painting for a little bit of light balance. And then the last thing I do is probably just add a vignette. I can use the TK panel vignette action. You could do a manual vignette in Photoshop if you wanted, but I've got the panel, which will do it for me really quickly. So there's a nice little vignette. And one of the things in the vignette is I don't want to darken where that light's coming from. So I'm going to grab a black brush and just paint on the mask to paint the vignette out of where the light source is. So now I'm just really directing the direction of that light. And that's fast, but let me just see here really quickly. I'm going to put these two background layers into a group so it can turn off and on everything else. So there's, and that's not even the original raw file because this is a version with uh, the adjustments made and the blended together. But this is after then the Photoshop adjustments. Pretty fast, but you can see where I'm going with that. All right, I have talked wow. longer than we should have. <laughs> no, amazing image. I mean, this is what you really saw that day. Uh, getting closer. I would still with this one do, I mean, I haven't done any real color balancing, color grading work with this and I would be more careful. But yeah, that is the scene that was there when I got out of my tent in the morning. Oh. This is basically out the front door of my tent. I was camped on this ridge Beautiful. and that morning, right before sunrise, that's right at sunrise. That's the scene. That's a golden hour, right? Golden hour time. The golden hour. Yeah. In fact, I knew exactly when golden hour was going to be because I had photo pills with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I also knew exactly what direction the sun was going to be coming from, that it was going to sidelight this scene wow. uh, perfectly. Awesome. Yeah. Actually, the, is, uh, this picture changes a lot depending on the time of the year you go there, it should, because the, the sun won't, won't be heating the city in the same direction. So light direction is super important, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. yeah. This is uh, at the kind of the height of summer, not, not June. This is probably mm -hmm. July or August. So the sun is pretty far north at sunrise. So yeah, this side of the mountain is getting some light on it. If I tried to ski in there and do this photo in the winter, 
mm-hmm. the sun would be behind the mountain more and the mountain would be backlit so it wouldn't get yeah. this light. Yeah, yeah. Planning is important. <laughs> okay, Sean, uh, do you want to ask a few more questions before we say goodbye? Absolutely. I'm here as long as anyone can stand me. <laughs> we have over 500 people now live and uh, yeah, here is dinner time. Uh, but let's go for it. So, okay. Roger, you sure? Sounds good. How do you decide to use duplicate smart objects instead of masks? Um, so, the in this case, because so much of what I was trying to bring back from this image, uh, the raw data will give me the most latitude in adjusting color, you know, the original white balance, in recovering shadows, in um, so many of those things. I would rather do that with raw adjustments. Um, And I could do it ahead of time in Lightroom, Mm -hmm. trying to make those raw adjustments. You know, I could make a, a virtual copy of my raw file and then try to create those raw adjustments in Lightroom first, but I'd just be guessing. So Mm -hmm. for me, it makes more sense to not make those raw adjustments first, bring it into Photoshop, duplicate it, and then I can work with the raw adjustments of the two layers. And I still am using it with a mask because the mask is what brings the two layers together. And then I can go back and forth and fine tune those raw adjustments and see how they work together. And so in that way, I'm getting the best of both worlds. I'm getting Mm -hmm. the ability to use the raw data and the raw adjustments of Lightroom or Camera Raw, but I'm combining them with the ability to use a mask and layers in Photoshop. So in that situation, um, yeah, that that's really powerful. Nice, thank you, thank you. I have another question from Jonathan Fragoso. How do you deal with our, our, somebody's calling me, probably to wish me. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday, okay, <laughs> call you later. Uh, yeah. So how do you deal with archiving the final edit? I don't want to group and delete layers so I can check edits in the future, but files usually become huge. They do become huge. So I, you know, this is a personal choice everyone has to make where their priorities are. I have let file size not be a priority. Um, for me, Uh, memory, hard drive space is fairly inexpensive. Um, To me, being able to have control over my image and also have access to all of my adjustments in the future when I come back and realize how badly I screwed this image up, (laughs) to be able to go back into every single adjustment I made and be Mm -hmm. able to adjust it, that's my priority. So if I get big file sizes, I get big file sizes. Um, Now, TIFF files, PSD files have a maximum file file size of two gigabytes, which is not very much these days. TIFF files can be up to four gigabytes, which is better. But, you know, with a 45 megapixel camera and lots of luminosity masks and layers and things, I can easily, it's easy to go over the four gigabytes. So in that case, I save as a a PSB file, which is a Photoshop big (laughs) file Mm -hmm. type. I don't love them. They're slow and cumbersome, but if that's what I need to do to save all of that rich information and control, I'm willing to do it. Nice. Uh, Thank you. Then we have Joe Adams. Uh, Is Sean using a Wacom tablet or a mouse or a trackpad? (laughs) I am using uh, a little bit of everything here. So I use my keyboard for some things. I use my mouse. I do have, uh, yeah, a tablet, and the tablet, um, I, I don't, some people I know use tablets for everything they do. The tablet for me is great for painting and brushing and the dodging and the burning, that kind of stuff, but for things where I need to be very precise, like get it on an exact pixel, I find the tablet to be very difficult sometimes, and also the tablet's horrible for menus and sliders and things like that. So I keep my mouse on hand. And then also I've been testing out, uh, this company sent me this um, recently. It's called Tourbox. Um, uh, 
anyway, I didn't ask them to send it to me. I was not a paid thing anyway. They just said, hey, give this a try, see what you think. And what this does is it does a lot of cool controls that you can totally customize wow. and get the keyboard out of it, uh, of the equation a lot. So I've been having some fun with that. So I kind of use everything. It's like you, you, you become a DJ here. Like. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm totally mixing because <laughs> I'm cool <laughs> like that, you know? Awesome. Then we have uh, Leo Flank. Uh, how did you split create the two the two initial smart layers so they don't interact with each other? Aha. Uh -huh. So it's all down to if we can go back to the screen, uh, or sorry, to my Photoshop screen. Let me close this so we can see. So um, when you have a smart object, if you duplicate the smart object. So if you use controller command J on your keyboard, or if you come up to layer and use duplicate, uh, oh, I'm in a group, that's why it's giving me duplicate group. If you come up to layer and say duplicate layer, or any other place where you can find duplicate layer, that creates a duplicate and it's a linked duplicate. So whatever happens to one smart object happens to the other smart object. But if you use instead, um, smart object, new smart object via copy. And it's also in the layer menu. And that's what this button does in the TK panel. New smart object via copy, that creates an unlinked smart object. So the two smart objects are independent of each other. You can adjust one and it won't also adjust the other one. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you for that. Let's go out here. Uh, Sandra is telling me that Nick Page is in the chat at the moment, probably helping people there. Hi, Nick. <laughs> Nick! <laughs> You're there after two hours. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. What are you doing here, Nick? <laughs> uh, learning from you, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. I Actually, I, I watched all of Nick's yesterday again, so I could learn and make sure uh, <laughs> I was on my game. I uh, send you a gears, Nick. Thank you. <laughs> for joining us in your super master class. Okay, okay. Then we have uh, Nuno Gon Gonzalez. Are you running Windows? What setup you're using regarding hardware? So I, I've, I, I'm a PC, so I run Windows. I've started with a PC back when I was a starving um, college student and teacher. And uh, I've just stuck with that the whole way through. Um, so yeah, so Windows machine and yeah, these days with all of this stuff, having a powerful machine for Photoshop is definitely good. I'm about due for a rebuild. I think my current machine is about five years old. Um, but I would say if you're building a PC or if you're purchasing a Mac or whatever for Photoshop, if you really want to be able to operate with big 16 bit, large files and all of that, you know, get as get as much RAM as you can afford, get a fast processor you can afford, get the best, most um, powerful graphics processor, CPU, um, all of that stuff. And if you can afford, um, you know, flash solid state memory, that all works faster. All that stuff goes together to making Photoshop run smoothly. So it really just comes down to what your budget is, I think. <laughs> awesome. And the last question, what's the discount code again? Ah, I think it's what's on your shirt. Photo bills. Photo bills. And how, how, how people can get your uh, online courses at 20% off. Yep. But what's your website? Uh, so, yeah, if you do a search for just a Google search for Sean Bagshot, you'll find my website. But if you want to just go direct, it's outdoorexposurephoto.com. Nice, 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 nice. And there you can get these uh, amazing tutorials with Sean, teaching yep. you everything you need. And, uh, and the TK panel. I sell, I mean, Tony sells all that stuff on his site, um, but I sell it on my site too. And the photo pills code is going to work on my site. So <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, I, I would love to have uh, Tony on the show in the future. That would be awesome, also. That would be awesome. If you can convince Tony, um, that would be amazing. Maybe you can convince him for me. <laughs> I can try. He's hard to convince. Tony's, uh, Tony loves to kind of be behind the scenes. Yeah, like me. Eh? Uh, you know, I'm a behind the scenes guy and I'm here. 
<laughs> you're you're a good you're a good behind and in front of the scenes <laughs> guy, I think. Sure, sure. So uh, any final words where people can find can find you? I mean, you have your YouTube channel if they you know uh, type YouTube uh, Sean back showing on YouTube. I'll find you. Yep. Sean Bagshaw Photography on YouTube. Yeah. My website, which we already saw. The one other place that I will mention really quickly, and maybe I can just do, a, uh, what are we, sh let me share something else just really fast because I have to give a proper shout out uh, to my friends and colleagues here, if I can find it, is, can we see this? Oh, no, we're not sharing it. Here, there we go. Now we see, yeah. So this is photocascadia.com and um, photocascadia is the the photography team that I'm a member of. There's seven of us. Um, it's me, Aaron Bobnick, David Cobb, Adrian Klein, Kevin McNeil, Chip Phillips, Zach Schnepp. They're all great friends for many, many years of mine. I know many of them are your friends too, Rafa. Yeah. Wonderful photographers. And so if you've never tuned in to photocascadia.com, go check it out. One of the things on here, uh, is our blog, which um, the blog, you can see here, there's a couple little blog posts, but you can get to it up here. We try to post a new article or video or something once a week. We don't get there every week, but it's all free and it goes back 10 years. So it's a huge library of articles about photography, all different aspects of landscape photography. So that's a great one. Also, we're really proud as a group. We, um, uh, published a book, or we didn't publish it, a publisher published uh, a book on Oregon, all of our images that came out um, a couple of months ago. And we're really happy and proud about that. So you can learn more about the book called Oregon, My Oregon. Congratulations. Yeah, publishing a book is a dream come true. It really was. And the the, the publisher, Timber Press, uh, came to us with the idea. Okay. And they're an Oregon publisher here. And it's been really great working with them. And uh, yeah, it's just, it, it was, like you said, it was a culmination of something that we always dreamed of, but had no idea how to actually get it done ourselves. So we're so grateful that Timber Press came to us. Yeah, it's great that uh, you get all uh, your work out there. Uh, by the way, do you sell prints? Uh, is it actually a business nowadays? Uh, it, selling prints is definitely a business for some people I know. Some people yeah. I know who yeah. really focus on that. Um, do quite well selling prints. So I know it's possible. I do sell prints um, mm -hmm. and it is a, a part, both prints and licensing stock images, cool. all parts of my business. Mm -hmm. um, the last, I want to say five to seven years, the, the education component has really yeah. uh, been in high demand. So I've really shifted my focus there and I enjoy it. Um, yeah. But when people get tired of listening to me, I'll probably go back to Selling prints more. <laughs> do you do a one-on-one -on -one education also, or or just uh, groups? Yeah, I do. I I do a few group workshops a year, mm -hmm. you know, before COVID, and hopefully soon again. Um, that that I can fit my schedule. Um, you, a lot of times with other Photo Cascadia members, and I do a lot of teaching and presenting at conferences and Photo Pills Camp and places like that. <laughs> I don't do, I used to do um, private guiding and private instruction, both in person and online, mm -hmm. but it got to the point where I just had more requests for that than I could accommodate. I mean, that would have to become my full-time job. And so at some point I just realized if I'm going to get any of my other work done and uh, <laughs> I have to not do that anymore. And I wish I still could, cause I really enjoyed it, but I figured, you know, the, the way for me to be able to spread the spread the to pay it forward and spread the knowledge as yeah. far as possible. Videos and things like this uh, can reach so many more people. Yeah, definitely. I know you also want time to get out there and shoot, right? <laughs> yeah, supposedly I'm still a photographer too. So <laughs> yeah, I've learned about many many pros that uh, they stop shooting because you know yeah manage the the business and it's uh, become it becomes like a, a trap instead of a, a joy. Yeah, if you, if you want to take a lot of photos, don't make it your job. <laughs> yeah, just do it for fun. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, Sean. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Any any final words you want to share with uh, the tribe? I'll just say, 
Rafa, thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's always great to be able to collaborate with you on stuff. Uh, I look forward to the next time we can hang out in real life again, because I miss that. And uh, thanks to everyone out there who tuned in, especially those of you who are still there. <laughs> and uh, I know this, like I said, if anybody's going to take a long time, it's going to be me. And uh, thanks to anyone who's watching this in the future who made it this far as well. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Guys, it's time to say goodbye. As always, remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot. Legendary photos. Bye-bye, and thank you so much for watching. See you in the next video. Bye.